So for the next eight weeks, we're going to be talking about divine appointments. So if you're ready to hear what I have to say, do me a favor and say, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. All right, let's get into it today. There's seven key feasts to the Lord that are recorded for us in the Old Testament. There's actually several other feasts as well, but these seven are very special. They're considered high holy days or high holy feasts. And as Christ followers, these seven feasts really have profound significance and meaning for us. And my guess is that most of you have probably never heard a lot of teaching on these feasts. Even though I went to theological seminary, it wasn't until about five years ago that I really first began to fully study and understand what God's trying to teach us with these seven feasts, especially as they relate to the saving acts of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So my first exposure to learning about this was from a Messianic Jewish pastor named Mark Biltz. And much of what I'll share over the next eight weeks is directly from his teaching on the subject. There's still a lot of Greg Scott mixed in there too, but I just want to give credit where credit is due. So today this message is going to just be an overview of how these seven key feasts came to be and what God's big picture is that he wants us to learn from each of them. And then we're going to look in depth for the next seven weeks, one feast each week. We're really going to dig in deep and see what it is that God wants us to learn about each of those feasts and what they have to do with us in this New Testament church age. So the main text throughout this series is going to be from Leviticus chapter 23. Today we're just going to look at the first two verses. It says this, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. So whose feasts are these we're going to be talking about? God's feast. The Lord says they are his feasts. It doesn't say they're the feasts of Israel. It doesn't say they're the feasts of the Jews. So a lot of times Christians, we say, well, that's a Jewish thing. We don't have to worry about that. Well, that's not true in this case. God says these are my feasts. They're instituted by God. Now, when we think of the word feast, what do we tend to think of? Food, right? Certainly a lot of eating takes place around feasts, these feasts included. But Other special events, food is involved in too, but these feasts of the Lord referred to here, they really have very little to do with eating. The Hebrew word that's been translated feast here is moed, moed, and moed is a word that means an appointment, a fixed time. So these feasts are divine appointments that are being set in stone, essentially. God says these aren't going to fade away. These aren't going to change or cease throughout history. This is very important for us to understand before we begin talking about these seven very important feasts that have kind of been lost to Christianity for the most part over the years. These are festivals that are fixed into place by God through an agreement. And by implication, this refers to somebody meeting together at a stated time, at an agreed-upon time, at an agreed-upon place, and with an agreed-upon plan of business. So let me give you an example of where this happens in our normal day-to-day world. Let's say you're going to get married. Well, the bride and the groom, they have to agree on the date and the time and the place where this event is going to happen, and they have to agree that the event that's going to happen when they get there is a wedding, right? We're not coming there for a party, we're coming there for a wedding. If either one of those people isn't clear on that, somebody's going to show up and somebody else isn't going to show up, and the one who did show up isn't going to be very happy, right? So this passage also tells us that we're to go proclaim these feasts, that's the word proclaim. Now, the Hebrew word that we translate proclaim is chara. And chara means to call out to those who are invited to come. Y'all come! It's like that, right? Come. It's very important to understand. Now, when I was a kid, I lived in a neighborhood where all the dads in the neighborhood had this special whistle. And I don't mean a musical instrument. I mean, they had a whistle that they did with their lips and their teeth and their tongues and their fingers. You know, I can't do it. I've never been able to do it. But some people can do that. You know, just really blast out a major whistle. And all the dads, for some reason in my neighborhood, there was this cultural thing, an expectation. Dads had to be able to do that. And so some of them went high, then low. Some went low, then high. Some went high, low, high, high, low, high, low, high, low. I mean, there was all kinds of different whistles. And every kid knew his dad's whistle. And so I would be out playing with my friends, you know, Mike and uh, Rick and Bob and uh, Shelly and Brian, and one of us would hear a whistle, and we'd all stop, and we'd listen. And if it was my dad's whistle, got to go, and I'm off. Or it was Bob's dad, got to go, I'm off. 
And so you knew when you heard your dad's whistle, it was time to come home. You're being invited home for dinner, and you better come home or you might go to bed without supper, right? So it's the same way when God calls us to come, when he hurrah, when he says, y'all come, if we don't come right away, we might miss out on the wedding supper of the Lamb. There's a great example of this in the Brit Chadashah, the New Testament in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, in your notes, it says Matthew 23. It's actually Matthew 22. Got a little typo there if you want to put 22 in there. So the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to this wedding feast. Chara. Hey, y'all come, right? And they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other servants, other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fattened livestock are all butchered. Everything's ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. The rest of them seized these slaves that had come to invite them to this wedding feast and mistreated them and killed them. This is a parable that Jesus told. So this is one of several places in Scripture that refers to the new creation after the judgment of earth as the wedding feast. And we hear it referred to as the wedding feast of the Lamb. In Scripture, Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom. The entire church body is referred to as the bride. And so we get a big picture of this parable. God the Father is the King. And he's going to hold this incredible celebration for his son and his bride, the church, when we're finally reunited together in the new heaven and the new earth. And God wants all of us who are currently following him to go out and proclaim it. Chara! Invite everyone to come to this greatest of all feasts. And we accept that invitation by saying yes to Jesus. We will follow you. We want to be part of the bride. We want to be part of the church. And so Jesus tells us, though, that most who are invited will pay no attention. They'll just go about their business. They'll ignore the invitation. He also says some who don't ignore the invitation will seize those who have invited them, seize Christ's followers, mistreat them, and kill them. We say, gosh, how often is that happening in our world today? We look around in the news every day. Christians are being mistreated, seized, beheaded, murdered all over our world this very minute just because they're inviting people to the wedding feast of the Lamb, just because they're Christ followers. So if you want to be sure that you have a seat at the wedding feast of the Lamb, you want to be sure that you understand these seven feasts that we're talking about in this series because every single one of them prophetically points to the person of Jesus Christ and the saving acts that he has already accomplished, and the ones that he'll accomplish in the future. Now, the truth is, in most Christian churches around the world, certainly in America, there's very little understanding of our Jewish roots. We tend to ignore the festivals, or we make light of the festivals, and yet God was very clear, we'll see in Leviticus 23, God was very clear that these feasts, these divine appointments, were to be a perpetual thing. Now, when I was a very young Christian, I was exposed to an incorrect teaching called replacement theology, which essentially teaches this, that the Jews, God's chosen people, because they didn't recognize the Messiah when he came, because they rejected him and crucified him, they're no longer God's chosen people. And now the Christian church is God's chosen people. And if the Jews will become followers of Christ, then they can be grafted back into God's new people, the church. That's actually not true at all. The Jewish people, the Israelites, have never stopped being God's chosen people. And we see this in the book of Romans that the Apostle Paul wrote. He's writing to Gentile Christians like most of us, and he's making sure that they know that this new church, this following of Jesus Christ, hasn't replaced God's chosen people of Israel. And he makes this analogy to Israel being like an olive tree. You've got a little illustration in your notes this morning to kind of help you put a visual uh, to this this, uh, scripture passage. And so Paul says, you know, some of the branches of the olive tree that is Israel were broken off when they rejected the Messiah when he came. They were the branches that were broken off. But he points out that the olive tree itself remained. The roots of the olive tree remained. It wasn't uprooted and thrown away and replaced with a whole new tree. The tree is still there. And so he says Gentiles who became followers of the Messiah were grafted on to the olive tree of Israel, but they didn't replace the tree. 
Paul then tells us that eventually those broken branches of Israel that were broken off because of their disbelief in Jesus as their Messiah, that those branches will be grafted back on to the olive tree when they finally come to see that Yeshua is the Messiah they've been waiting for all those years. And so here's what Paul says in Romans 11. You have that little olive tree diagram. Hopefully that'll help make this a little more clear. So the first two verses of Romans 11, Paul says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Makes it real clear, no doubt. Then verse 16, he says, If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is holy also. And if the root is holy, the branches are holy also. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, speaking to the Gentile Christians, you being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, don't be arrogant toward the branches, those that were broken off. Don't be arrogant towards the Jewish people who didn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But if you're arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. He continues. He says, you'll say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. He says, quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Don't be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he'll not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. He says, if you continue in his kindness, uh, that'll happen. God's kindness will continue. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Then he says, for if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? And then he kind of wraps this thought up, and he says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. He says that's a partial, that a partial hardening, a hardening of the heart, has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. This happened so that all the Gentiles would have an opportunity to come and be grafted into God's original plan that Israel is a part of. And so that happened to make room for the Gentiles. And then he says, and so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So there's a whole lot more that I could teach about this, easily an entire sermon series. But for today, I just want you to hear, the church has not replaced Israel. Israelites are still God's chosen people, and we as Gentile Christians have been fortunate enough to be grafted into their original deal because of our faith in Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And Paul says all Israel will be saved in spite of their rejection of Jesus when he came the first time. And so those of us who have been grafted in from a wild olive tree onto the cultivated olive tree of the Jewish people, the tree that has the original holy root, the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we need to remember and embrace and appreciate our Jewish roots because that's the only way we can really fully understand, interpret, and experience all that God has for us here in this Brit Hadashah, the New Testament the church age, because there's so much in the New Testament that if you don't understand the culture and the religious background of the Jewish people, you're missing the big picture of what you're reading in the New Testament. It's an amazing thing when you begin to fully understand what's going on in the Old Testament. All of a sudden you read the New Testament and go, oh, that's what that's talking about. It's just an amazing moment when that happens. So having said all that, let's go back to that first verse we started with this morning. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. So notice that these feasts, these divine appointments, are also called holy. That's the Hebrew word kadesh. And kadesh means to be sacred, to be set apart for God's use. They're also called in in this scripture by God convocations. That's the Hebrew word mikra. Mikra. 
Mikra means an assembly of celebration, uh, a convocation. And so when I think of a convocation, I often think of a convocation center at a college. That's where the big graduation convocation is held, right? It's just it's kind of a big celebration event. But this word in, in Hebrew, mikra, it also means a rehearsal. It means a practice assembly. We could call it a dress rehearsal. And if you've ever been in a, a band or a dramatic presentation, you know there's always a dress rehearsal, right? Everybody puts on whatever costumes, they check the lights, they check the makeup, everybody runs through the whole thing even though there's no audience there. We're making sure we've got it all down. It's the same idea. So God says these feasts, these are convocations, these are rehearsals, dress rehearsals for the big event that's coming sometime in the future, for these prophetic events that are associated with the Messiah. So the feasts of the Lord are intended by God's original design to be divine appointments, signals, announcements, dress rehearsals for his people that makes them ready for the Messiah when he comes. And so they're of incredible significance and importance to God. In fact, he designed his entire creation around these feasts and their appointed times. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis 1, first chapter of the Bible, verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, the Hebrew word for signs here is oath and the Hebrew word for seasons is moed. Moed, that's the same word that we started with in Leviticus that refers to feasts, right? These divine appointments. Let them be for divine appointments. Let them be for holy convocations. Let them be for dress rehearsal signals. That's what he's saying. So when we think of seasons, we think, oh, winter, fall, spring, summer. That's not what this word seasons means. It means let them be for signaled divine appointments. So understand that among all the other things that the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets do in our universe, the very first reason that God created them, according to Genesis 1.14, was for signs, for signals, for announcements of God's appointed times and events, including these seven high holy feasts. So this is God's first clock. This is God's first calendar. Let's talk about calendars for a second, because there are several types of calendars in our world, several different ways of marking time. And some systems have come and gone, uh, we think of the Mayan calendar. It was big in the news a few years back. The Mayan calendar ran out, so everybody said maybe time on earth has run out, and we all waited. Nope, still going on. Okay, Mayans were wrong. And so then we moved on, right? And so then we've got the Julian calendar that was named for Julius Caesar. Uh, we know the Muslims have their own calendar. Now we mostly, we've got a Chinese calendar. We mostly in America, we operate on the Gregorian calendar. Now I would love to take credit for creating the Gregorian calendar, I would love to take credit for inventing the Gregorian chant and even the word gregarious. That would be awesome if I could claim ownership of those, but I can't. They all happened before my time. So the Gregorian calendar replaced the Julian calendar, and the Gregorian calendar that we use is totally based on the movements of our sun. It's based on the sun. It's a solar calendar. The Muslim calendar, by contrast, is based totally on the movements of the moon. It's a lunar calendar. But back in Genesis 1, God says, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So God's biblical calendar, the Jewish calendar, uses both the sun and the moon in marking and calculating time. Now we know to keep our Gregorian calendar up to date with the sun, we've got to add a leap day every four years, right? Once every four years is a leap year, we put an extra day at the end of February and that kind of balances out everything. To keep the biblical calendar connected properly to both the sun and the moon, the Jewish calendar has to add an entire month on occasion. So seven times over a 19-year period, an extra leap month, if you will, is added into the Hebrew calendar. And that's because the months are based on the moon, but the years are based on the sun. Right? Moon goes around, we get a full moon once a month, but we go around the sun once a year. So as a result of this, there are many things in God's dual calendar here that are prophetically scheduled to take place on that biblical calendar that we will totally miss or fail to understand if we try to look at them or expect them on our Gregorian calendar. 
Now back to that Hebrew word oath that I referred to. It refer- means a sign or a signal for God's appearing. So it says that the sun, the moon, the stars are God's signal lights for his appearing. You think about the star that the wise men followed all the way to Bethlehem until they found the newborn king, right? And remember that these things take place at God's predetermined appointed times. And we look at Revelation 13:8. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. So he's saying here and in other passages that from the foundation of the world, God had already predetermined the days and times when all the events of biblical prophecy, including the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the second advent of Jesus Christ. He'd already determined all those dates and times from the foundation of the world. Think about all the various time zones of our world. Let's keep it simple and just think about the United States for now. We've got Eastern time zone, Central time, Mountain time, Pacific time, Alaskan time. There's something in between there. And then there's Hawaiian Aleutian time, right? We've got all these different time zones. Now, back in my home state of Ohio, there are people who live on the western side of Ohio, right on the border of Indiana, and that's actually the border between the eastern and the central time zone. So there are actually people who might live in Ohio, but work in Indiana, or they might work in Indiana, but, or the other way around, live in Indiana and work in Ohio. And so they actually are living and working in two different time zones, and a lot of them will actually carry two different watches or have two different clocks to keep track of what time is it back home while I'm here at work, right? So we kind of have to do that too. As the Church of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that we live and work and worship in two different time zones. We've got the Gregorian calendar that we use for our work and our day-to-day life within our culture, but spiritually, we really need to understand and use the biblical calendar as well. So I want you to take all that into account and then consider this, that God predetermined the divinely appointed day the when, the how, even the music that would be sung at his son's conception, birth, death, funeral, resurrection, second coming, the day of judgment, and the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth created after the destruction of this one. All of the feasts are just dress rehearsals for these huge monumental events. So the first four feasts we'll look at in this series over the next four weeks They take place in the spring, and they're all divine appointments that are dress rehearsals for the first coming of Jesus, Jesus the Messiah. And at the end of this series, we're going to get to the last three feasts, which all happen uh, at the second coming of Jesus the Messiah. And we're going to learn as we get to the last one, the festival of Sukkot, that that's uh, likely when Jesus was born. And there's a big hint, it wasn't December 25th. And so with all that understanding, let's look again at a paraphrased version now of that first verse we started with, Leviticus 23. This is kind of a paraphrase to bring all those definitions of these Hebrew words into into place for us. Speak unto the children of Israel concerning my appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy dress rehearsals. These are for my divinely set appointments. So real quickly today, we're just going to give an overview an outline of sorts for the seven feasts. I'm going to share their Hebrew names, their English translations, a brief description of what each of these mean for the Jewish people, and then a brief description of how they connect for us as followers of Christ to the acts of Jesus. And then again, starting next week, we're going to take on one festival a week, one divine appointment per week, and we're going to dig a lot deeper. And I think you'll be amazed if you'll stick with me on this. You've got a little diagram in your notes that uh, lays out the feasts a little bit for you as an illustration so you can see how they line up. We're going to outline and highlight each one briefly. Now you think about the Jewish uh, religious year. Uh, It starts with this what's called the first month and it's actually right about now or a few weeks ago is when that month uh, started. So it didn't start January. But you think about our Christian year, it really kind of starts in Advent. That's what it really starts is to think about 
uh, the coming of Jesus Christ. That's where our faith really starts. And we get through Advent, we go through a time period called ordinary time, and then we get to uh, the period of Easter. We celebrate all of that, the resurrection of Christ, then we kind of go back to ordinary time for a while. Then we celebrate Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then we kind of go back to ordinary time for a while, and then we eventually get back to Advent. And so there's this cyclical thing to our religious year, right? Well, it's the same thing for Judaism. So the first month of the Jewish religious year is a month called Nisan. And on the 14th of Nisan, we have a festival called Pesach. And the English name for Pesach is the Feast of Passover. The Feast of Passover. And the significance that it has for Israel is it commemorates the redemption of Israel from slavery in Egypt. This is when God set them free. And he did it by visiting several plagues on the Egyptian people who refused to let their slaves, the Israelites, go. And these plagues kind of escalated until they got to the 10th plague, the biggest plague, which was the death of all firstborn. And God said, you know, this plague's not going to touch you, my chosen people, if you'll do this. Sacrifice a lamb instead of your firstborn children. You can let this lamb be a substitute for you. Take its blood paint it on the walls of your doorposts, and this will be a covering for you. And so when the angel of death comes to visit death upon the firstborn, he'll see the blood and he'll pass over you. You'll be covered by the blood. And so that's what's commemorated on Passover. So for the significance for us as the church, Jesus was crucified on this day. The scriptures tell us he is the ultimate Passover lamb. He is the one who was substituted for us on the cross, and we are covered by his blood. Our sins are forgiven. We've been redeemed. So for us, the Passover is all about the crucifixion of Jesus, and Jesus really fulfilled the ultimate meaning of the Passover feast that the Jewish people had been celebrating for 1,500 years up to this point. Jesus finally fulfills it on that day, to the very day of Passover. Then the second feast happens starting the very next day. It's a seven-day feast. They're, they're kind of lumped together. And so this is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread in English. This is Chag Chomatzi in Hebrew. And we sometimes hear Passover and we think of it, it's this whole long festival. But technically, Passover was the first day. And then the rest of the festival, Unleavened Bread, is sandwiched right on the end of it. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is the barley harvest Uh, for Israel, in ancient Israel. It was an agricultural society. And the feast was to teach them that a life without leaven is a life without sin. And the focus of this feast is supposed to be on having a holy walk with God, really focus on what it means to to rest upon uh, God and walk with Him and be holy, be set apart from Him. And so we know that this is the day that Jesus and our sins were buried, just as He is unleavened, Without sin, we are to follow him. We're made unleavened by his sacrifice for us and our relationship with him. It's because of his sacrifice we're able now to walk a holy life with God. We weren't before his sacrifice. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread prophetically points to the burial of Jesus. And Jesus ultimately fulfilled this feast that had been practiced for 1,500 years. He fulfills this feast on this very day. Then we have the third feast, Nisan 17th, which happens right in the middle of the seven-day feast. So these, again, are just right on top of each other. This is called Rashid Katsir. In Hebrew, it means the Feast of First Fruits in English. And this celebrates the beginning of that barley harvest that we're talking about. It's about celebrating and thanking God for the first harvest of the year, the barley harvest. And we bring our first fruits before him, the best and most choice uh, parts of what has grown during that harvest season. It's the principle behind the tithe in the church. We give our first fruits, the best of our labors, to God first, and then we trust that he'll provide for us and bless us with the remainder. And so that's what's going on here. And this is also proof for them that when we bury our seeds in the ground in the winter and those seeds seem to be dead and buried, they will once uh, eventually come back to life. They'll burst up through the ground and we'll see them rise again one day. So the significance to the church is that Jesus was resurrected on this day. Paul calls Jesus the first fruits among many brothers and sisters, that Jesus was the first one to rise from the dead like this. He rose, but our sins remain dead and buried. And so just like those seeds in the winter, Jesus was planted and buried, but he rose again as the first fruits, the new harvest 
of God. And again, Jesus fulfilled this feast that had been celebrated for 1,500 years before, and he did it to the very day. So then 50 days pass, and we get to the fourth feast that happens in the month of Sivan, and it's on the sixth day of Sivan. And the Hebrew name for this is Shabuot, Shabuot. The English name is the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. And this feast celebrates the giving of the Torah, that after 49 days in the wilderness, after they left Israel, Moses leads the Israelites to Sinai, and God descends in smoke and fire onto the top of the mountain to present himself to the Israelites. Shavuot happens on the 50th day then, after those 49 days. Moses goes up and meets with God on the top of Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights to receive the tablets of stone that contain God's law. And then when he comes down, he finds out that the Israelites have sinned a great sin. They've returned to their idolatry ways. They build a golden calf to worship, and Moses is livid. He throws these tablets down and destroys them. The people are judged severely, and we read that 3,000 Israelites were killed that day by God's judgment. That's the first Pentecost, the first Shavuot. So then the significance to the church, we get to... uh, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 of our New Testament, and we see that this is the day the Holy Spirit was given. He descends in tongues of fire with a mighty rushing wind. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Coming down on Mount Sinai. And the apostles receive the Holy Spirit, and they share the gospel with the crowds gathered in Jerusalem. And while on the first Pentecost, 3,000 people died, on this Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. Is that a coincidence? Probably not. So Pentecost is about the giving of the Holy Spirit. So first God gave us the law, and then he gave us the one who will help us understand and obey the law on that later Pentecost that we read about in the New Testament. So then we go sometime later, and we get to Feast 5 that's in the month of Tishri. This is a one-day feast, but it's actually celebrated on two days because... They know it's time to begin the feast when several witnesses both can say there's a sliver of a new moon in the sky. They both have to say, I see the sliver of the new moon. And if they can't agree, they can't start. And so they said, even though it's a one-day feast, let's celebrate it two days so that we're sure we don't miss anything along the way. We just, to be safe, let's celebrate this one-day feast on two days. This is called Yom Teruah, Yom Teruah in Hebrew. The English name is the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. So here's the significance to the Jewish people. The trumpet blasts of this feast are supposed to jolt the Israelites from their spiritual slumber so that they can remember that the Lord their God, the King of the universe, is still large and in charge and wants their attention. And then the ten days of awe begin. It's a period of repentance and good works. At the beginning of the ten days of awe, your name is either in the book of death or it's in the book of life. But you've got 10 days to kind of change your fate and get out of the book of death into the book of life if you repent and if you live your life differently and you do the right thing. So then at the end of the 10 days of awe, the books are sealed and whichever book you're in, that's where you're at for the rest of the next year until you get back to the next 10 days of awe and then you got a chance to get over there again. So that's the history of what they're doing. It's a period of repentance and good works. The people want to have their name sealed in the book of life rather than in the book of death. So the trumpets signal repentance for those who need to. So here's the significance for us as the church. Jesus will return during this feast, either on the first day or the second day, because no man knows the day or the hour. But Paul tells us when the last trump sounds, when the last trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up to meet them in the air. The Feast of Trumpets is all about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then the sixth feast happens Just a few days later, at the end of the 10 days of awe, Tishri 10, Yom Kippur. The English name is the Feast of Atonement. And the significance to Israel is that it's the climax of the days of awe, the day Moses returned from his second trip up Mount Sinai. He came down, found them sinning, smashed the tablets. He went back up and he made restitution to God. He comes back down 40 days and 40 nights later with new tablets. And that's God's new law. So the one day of the year that the high priest can enter the Holy of Holies to atone for the people of Israel 
That's the same day. And we've talked a lot about that in recent series. So the significance to the church, Jesus, our great high priest, who has atoned for the sins of all who receive him, will judge all of humanity beginning on this day. Will your name be found sealed in the Lamb's book of life? The Feast of Atonement is all about the judgment of Jesus. When he shares the parable about uh, separating the sheep from the goats, this is the day he's talking about. And then the last feast, Feast 7, is a feast that goes from Tishri 15 to Tishri 21. It's called Sukkot. The English name is the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's a significance for the Israelite people. It's a reminder that God wants to dwell among his people. It's a reminder that God provided shelter for the Israelites in the wilderness. It's also the final harvest of the year. It's the last harvest. It's the final chance. It's the fruit harvest. Sukkot is so full of joy, it's also known as the season of our rejoicing. And as the last festival of the harvest, it's also known as the festival of ingathering. Significance to the church, Jesus will dwell with us forever starting on Sukkot. He will tabernacle among his people. And all the people of the new earth will come to the new Jerusalem on this day every year. This is also, and I'll show you when we get to this seven weeks from now, this is also Jesus' birthday. This is when Jesus was likely born, the first time the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us was during the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Feast of Sukkot celebrates when the kingdom of God is established by Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth. So again, if Jesus fulfilled the four spring feasts on the actual day, it makes sense that he would fulfill the fall feasts on the very days of those feasts as well. What year? We don't know. We don't know. Not yet. So let's wrap it up. Last week on Thursday night, I told you, took you through the Seder meal of Passover. Next week, we're going to look at some other specific aspects of that Passover feast. We're going to see how all of this has pointed to Jesus. 1,500 years before he came, they'd been dress rehearsaling this. So I really hope you'll make worship attendance a priority for the next seven weeks and join me as we're going to see clear evidence that every one of these feasts has either been fulfilled or will be fulfilled by Jesus our Messiah. Let's pray as Dan comes to lead us in our closing hymn. Father God, we thank you so much for uh, the depth of your word and I know this is a lot to take in. We're trying to move slow but we want today just to kind of be an overview so if, if people aren't really sure they want to participate, they kind of see today, what's the big picture, where are we going with this? If they miss something along the way, at least they've got a little, uh, little snippet of what to expect. So God, I pray for each and every person here today, if they've never kind of put this together, that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and the God of the Jewish people is the God of the Christian people, and Jesus was Jewish Jesus came and showed us the way back to the only God that there is. I pray that every one of us would have uh, a deeper relationship with the whole uh, Bible, the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, and that we would have a greater appreciation for who you are, how you work, and how your calendar and timetable affects us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.